Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Dr. CJ. I'm Dr. Kathy J. Campbell, and I'm a family doc and sports medicine physician at Cleveland Clinic Canada. This is our seventh webinar, and uh, it's a weekly series that we started at the beginning of COVID-19 to kind of get us all through this difficult time. Many topics have come up, which have been uh, very interesting. They're, they're new areas of concern. Parenting has never been so difficult uh, with us taking on so many different roles. Uh, stress and anxiety, mental health issues, uh, even diet uh, type issues have come up and we've discussed this during this program for sure. Before we get started, I wanted to thank Cleveland Clinic Canada for keeping all of the employees going here. Uh, it's been wonderful support and also wanted to thank Mike Kessel, who's our CEO, uh, for continuing support uh, throughout this uh, crazy time. So I'd like to introduce our uh, special guest today and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Julia Elaine and uh, Beth Douglas, who's uh, a doctor of chiropractic. Uh, Julia is a family doc. She has a focused practice in sport and exercise. And prior to medical school at McMaster University, she did um, complete uh, her physiotherapy and completed also a master's in education about 10 years ago. She's one of our rock stars at uh, Cleveland Clinic Canada here, and she's had an amazing Olympic career. She's participated as a team physician in five Olympic Games uh, in several roles, including, including rather the chief medical officer of the London Olympics in 2012. I had the delight of working with Julia at the London Olympics in 2012, where I was the team physician for the Canadian women's soccer team, who proudly won a bronze medal in the 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, so uh, wonderful to have Julia here. She came back from London and then started as the Chief Medical Officer of the Pan Am and Para Pan uh, American uh, Games in Canada in Toronto here in 2015. And one thing I didn't realize was uh, in my research is that it was actually the largest sporting event uh, ever hosted on Canadian soil. So there's a little uh, trivia uh, question for, uh, for the next trivial pursuit that anyone is playing out there. So that is uh, amazing. And we're delighted to have Julia here today. Uh, I also want to introduce Beth, who's a chiropractor at Cleveland Clinic Canada. She's a much loved clinician. We all love Beth. And uh, she's known for her magic hands. She can fix anything. Uh, so we're delighted to have uh, Beth here. She has a strong background in physical fitness and uh, in running and running workshops. And she'll tell us soon about her current free workshop that's ongoing right now. She uses a variety of techniques, uh, including active release, Graston technique, acupuncture. She does it all. Uh, she did some of her training at Lakehead, where she did a kinesiology degree at uh, uh, Lakehead, and uh, did her chiropractic at the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College in Toronto here. She also, the beauty of these webinars is that you get to find out all kinds of things about people. I didn't know that Beth actually uh, used to own a winery uh, in Niagara, uh, on the lake. So um, this webinar is a, a very uh, interesting way to snoop into uh, all the people that I'm in contact with. So welcome to both of you. And um, first, I well, I have two questions for you. One is, how are you doing through all this? And the second question is, uh, can you Give us one positive thing that has come out of COVID-19 for you, for each of you, either personally or professionally. Perhaps start with Julia. Uh, thanks, Kathy, and glad to join you this morning and hello to everyone. Well, I think, how am I doing? Um, 
COVID has been ups and downs. I referred to it the other day as the great pivot. I know we often look back to the great depression, but it is that constant changing that I think uh, I'm getting better at constant change. As far as the one silver lining, I, I was thinking about this and you know, I'm sleeping better. I, I probably many people aren't, but to tell you the truth, I don't have to commute. I've got more regularity, more routine. I'm sleeping longer and better. I'm not hearing any sound, so I'm feeling very well rested. That's my silver lining. Great, super, Beth. Thanks for having me on, Kathy. This is a lot of fun. Um, I would say that I am doing better. It was a big change initially because both of my children are homeschooling through their um, private school. So we essentially have four full-time jobs going on currently at my house and it's a, it's a big change. So there was a lot of learning boundaries and learning how to balance life again. But with that also comes a big silver lining for me because as you know, I, I live in Niagara Lake. So I commute to and from Toronto, which is about three hours a day for me. So I'm able to now see my children a lot more than I was able to and spend time with my family. So it may be a bit disjointed between Zoom sessions, but uh, we are able to spend a lot more time together, which is nice. And I think it, it, it is an interesting time. And I think a lot of us have realized that we can do a lot more working from home than perhaps we thought we could. Um, and maybe that, for some of us, that might be even more efficient in terms of the amount and type of work we can do. So some positive messages for sure. Um, one thing that, uh, that you did during this COVID time, Julia, is to start a wonderful blog. And I used to read it uh, uh, every day um, on Facebook and uh, wonderful messages from um, mental health, on stretching, on walking is good medicine. And uh, how did you come up with this? And maybe tell us what your most popular blog was. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, I have always been interested in wellness as the key component of health. And this goes back to my physiotherapy days and back to medicine. But during my Olympic career, um, after the Torino Olympics, uh, we had a debriefing session and everyone mentioned what they thought went well and didn't go well. And I said, we're a great mash unit dealing with injuries, but we're not doing anything on wellness and prevention and helping people maintain their optimal health. And that led to a very uh, rewarding and long project where we started to incorporate wellness centers into the Canadian building of the Olympic Village. And we were able to do that in Beijing and Vancouver and Toronto and the tradition continues. And that was based on the philosophy that there is so much information out there that how do we know what's right and what's wrong. And so WellSense was an opportunity to use evidence-based wellness, to put a filter on wellness information and really get down to the things that make a difference and things we can self-manage, things we can do for ourselves. And I had had this idea for a long time. I actually had already registered the business. I had received a call from Revenue Canada last November uh, where they said, uh, you've been submitting zero income, zero expenses for five years on your WellSense business. And I said, I know, I know, just give me one more year, I'll try it. Uh, COVID happened, I felt the need to fill the gap and I started to write. I've been on a hiatus for about two weeks as I've been gathering material. We're going to actually uh, offer some products, offer some seminars, some online education, uh, and that's starting this weekend. So I. I do think that it's filled a gap and it's helped me take what I have been building for a long time and realize that there is a need. You take requests? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> How about one on cutting your own hair? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a great idea. As you can see, my oh. hair is longer than my initial picture. <laughs> well, well some, someone asked us to, to try to do a, a webinar on that, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I did give a go to the bangs here, but uh, I think we'll hold off on that one. 
Uh, as far as the most popular, uh, there were two that skyrocketed, resilience and willpower. Uh, those two by far were the most popular with the public. Huh. We'll, we'll come back to that uh, probably and talk more about, uh, in particular, resilience. We did have some sessions with our psychologists and, you know, repeatedly that came up. Um, so, uh, very interesting. Um, Beth, you are doing a free 10-week uh, running program. And uh, it actually started last week. Um, and the second session is today. Uh, perhaps, well, first off, is it too late to join uh, for the audience uh, participants out there? And uh, secondly, um, can you tell us more about this program? And uh, what is the purpose? Who's speaking? And um, give us some more details. Uh, sure. So, no, it's absolutely not too late to join. Uh, we actually record our sessions every week and they get sent with a summary to the people who have signed up on the link the day after so they'd have access to the talks that are being done because not everybody can make a 12 o'clock session. So it's Thursdays at 12 o'clock to 1230. And so if you can't make it, you'll get the session link the next day where you can watch the actual topic. And that's at the same time when you'd be given your homework as well. So every week we give a series of uh, your next goals, essentially. So the link should be in the chat function where you can sign up. Uh, you just have to click, click on it, fill out your name and your email. And I think there's a little code you have to do. And once you sign up, you'll get a confirmation and you should just start receiving those, those links. So essentially this, um, Sorry, I've always, yep. Sorry Beth, just to interrupt you there. So I put up uh, your email. Um, but also, uh, Sophie has, as you mentioned, put in the uh, chat box further details. So if they want to jump from, from this webinar on to another free webinar at noon, um, uh, you're going to talk more about what's coming up here. So keep yeah. going. So I've done a lot of um, running programs in the past. I used to work a lot with the running room for probably about five years. And I worked with anyone from a learn to run all the way up to half marathon. And as I was home, as we all are, you, you start to notice the number of people just itching to kind of get out to do something and to be more active. And so when I started to take a look around at the people running, you really get a sense of who's a runner and who's just really wanting to get out of the house to do something. Because you can notice that the footwear might not be quite right, their, their attire may not be quite right. And so I've never done a virtual running program before, but I definitely saw a need uh, for people to be able to connect and for people to get the right information to make sure that they're going to engage in a new activity in a safe way. So we divided it up into 10 weeks and we divided it up into three different categories so people can pick what their goal would be. So for example, there's a learn to run and at the end of that learn to run after 10 weeks, they'll be running for five kilometers. There's a 10 kilometer group. So for the people who run already five kilometers but are looking to go a little bit further, there's a 10 kilometer group. And there's also a half marathon group. So you, you pick which group you like and that's the group you follow. Um, we have a variety of specialists throughout our clinic who are volunteering their time, which is amazing because this is not the kind of thing you get in any regular running program. So we have Megan Grantham speaking today, who's our chiropodist, and uh, she's going to be speaking specifically on your footwear, proper footwear for running today. Uh, we have Dan Stasiak, who's our local, um, our resident marathon runner. He's done Boston a few times. Very proud of him. He also runs our running clinic at the clinic. Uh, he'll be doing a series of two talks, one on warm-ups and stretching, and another one on where do you go from here at the end. We have uh, Leslie, who's going to be, she's our, our cart, she leads up our cardiac team. She'll be speaking about heart rate. We have our physiotherapist, Stacy, who's going to be doing a talk on biomechanics and hip and knee health. And uh, Jacqueline Pritchard's team is going to be doing a talk on nutrition. So a wide variety to encompass everything that we have and um, just leading people in a safe way with a proper kind of um, a lot of people just go, oh, I can run 10K and off they go. And they've never run before. And that's just really not a good way to start. It's not healthy. They're going to get injured. Um, there's a lot of other things that can happen to them as well. 
So this is just a good standardized way for people to start to learn to run and love it. Like we don't want people to start and, and stop or get frustrated. And our emails are provided every week and we're just really there to support people however we can. Well, that's excellent. And as you mentioned, there's uh, the second of the series is right after this webinar. And as I said, the information is on the, uh, the chat. Um, so Julia, I'm going to go uh, to this great slide that you sent in to me. And it really speaks about um, exercise helping uh, immunity. And why is that important? Well, here we are in the middle of COVID-19 uh, and uh, the, the better we can fight infection, uh, uh, this is important. Uh, can you speak to this slide and give us more information about exercise and improving our immunity? Sure, thanks, Kathy. Uh, this was, a, I think, a finding probably in the last decade, and it's been substantiated in the research. And, and here is the key. If you exercise at a moderate level, you will increase your immunity, have less infections, recover from infections faster, and you actually have physiological changes of increasing your immune cells. But if you exercise too much, it actually reduces immunity. So there is this optimal zone of how you can use your exercise to boost your immunity without depleting it. What about people who do brief, vigorous, uh, maybe gardening or a quick run? Well, it's not gonna harm you, but it may not be enough to help you. So the key is to get into that 40 to 50 minute zone of exercise where the physiological changes of your immune system start to kick in. Now I'll tell you personally, I have, I'm a big believer in this and I've read the science. And when I start to get that tickle in my throat or maybe the start of feeling a bit of a headache, I actually do some moderate exercise. It's not to say that I can ward off everything, but I certainly recover faster if anything's happening. And sometimes I will not further go into an, a cold or an infection. The key is that right now, I think it's a great time for Beth to do the running clinic because this is the time where you wanna really build your immunity. In the fall, we always have a flu season. There's talk of a second wave. Let's use the summer to make us stronger. Now, what would moderate intensity mean uh, for the average person? Yeah, it means that you have some sweat on your brow. So you have to have a bit of sweat. You don't have to be drenched, but you have to have some sweat on your neck or on your brow to show that your body's actually increasing its body temperature. And we think it's the body temperature rise that triggers some of the T cell reactions. It also means that you can still say a sentence, sing a line of a song. You have... Uh, the ability to maintain what we call the talk test. But you can't do a Shakespearean soliloquy or sing a long song, uh, but you still have enough breath. So it's that moderate intensity where you have some sweat, where you're breathing a bit faster, but you're still able to function at a high level. And it, it uh, brings up what we call the Borg scale, which is zero means doing nothing, no activity, and 10 is the most intense exercise. So just along with that, about level five, if you're, if you're judging your activity on that scale, a five would be kind of moderate intensity as well, where you can speak a little bit, uh, maybe in, in uh, chopped up sentences, uh, with a little sweat, as you said. So yeah. that's a good indication of how hard to go. And this is, a, this is a great picture of that as well. And if you use the Borg scale, they also describe it by words. So it would be called that your activity is somewhat challenging yeah. versus very, very challenging. And if you go by heart rate, you're at about 65 to 75% of maximum heart rate. Yeah. So, um, so Beth, Julia mentioned about the importance of maybe working up to 40 to 50 minutes of, uh, of moderate uh, exercise, but, but 
let's say I'm sitting here and I've done the, what do they call it, the quarantine 15, where you've gained 15 pounds over the last couple of months. You, uh, you've been doing your work from home, which means that you're working all the time instead of just your, your work hours. Uh, you're parenting, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're teaching your kids, you're taking on all these different roles. So how would you suggest that, and I haven't been a runner in the past, let's say, uh, how do I get started? So I think the first thing you need, Kathy, would be the right tools. So if it is running, you definitely need a good pair of footwear. Um, because without it, you will run into some issues later on because your biomechanics are important. Um, you do need to have a heart rate monitor. Well, you don't need to have one, but it's a good idea to have a heart rate monitor so you can monitor those kind of changes in your heart rate like um, Dr. Lean was just speaking about. Um, a stopwatch can be handy if you're getting going because the first stage in our running program is really like taking people from the couch and moving them into to start to become a runner. So we've kind of incorporated a bit of running and a little bit of walking so that you can increase gradually. The key is not to go from zero to hero and you really have to kind of take it, it nice and slow. So that's a, that's a really important thing to do. And I'm guessing that that moderate, you know, that, you know, if they don't have the stopwatch and so forth, that the, if you're looking at zero is sitting on your butt and 10 is, sprinting up a hill, that five, if you're thinking of five and talking throughout the exercise to some level is, is another good indicator of that. Yeah, I think that, um, I think the other thing is when you look at increasing people's distances, you're also, there's a very, there's specific metrics that we tend to use. So in running, we use a 10% increase per week. So the program that we created is very much guided to very specific increases, which have been shown to not provoke a lot of injuries so that people can still really enjoy doing what they're, what they're doing. So there are some restrictions built into the program to, to allow for that. The other thing is, is I would say that you really need to kind of get motivated. So, you know, picking the same day that you run, the same time that you run, maybe jazzing yourself up with a bit of fun music before you go out. You've got to make it fun for yourself so that your brain associates it with something that you're going to like to do. If you feel like the whole thing is painful, we're not going to start off from a really great place. And at the end of the run, I often say, you should do something for yourself. You know, let that negative flow of your brain exit saying you can't do it, you can't do it, because everyone can do it. And it, it can be a lot of fun. Uh, you just really don't want that negative chatter to kind of really stop you from even getting out of the gates. So when you get home, you can maybe have a nice a bath or you can have a nice healthy shake. You can kind of make your own routine so that your brain says, that was fun, let's do it again. So, uh, Julie, I'll throw a, uh, another question at you, um, following up on what Beth has uh, spoken about. Let's say I'm at home and I'm, there's no way I'm going to start a running program, let's just say. Uh, and that's because uh, I'm a certain age. I've got, uh, not that that should limit you, but uh, let's say I have some arthritis. I have some blood pressure issues, which actually running would help. But let's say I have arthritis in my knee and, and my doctor has told me that maybe running isn't the best thing that I should be doing. Um, but I want to, I want to, I want to boost my immune system. I, I want to get active. So, so what should I be doing, Julia? So I think that a nice broad uh, perspective of fitness is really useful. And fitness is strength, stretch, balance, and cardio. And running is helping with cardio and strength. So I might say that if it's difficult for you to start a running program, you start with one of the other components. So maybe I'm going to start with a chair sitting class. Maybe I'm going to start with some balance exercises, some restorative yoga, some gradual yoga. Um, maybe you've got a bike at home or a bike in the garage that you can just start with a, a non-impact activity. I know the pools are closed right now, but once we get through this, water activities can be very helpful for someone with any kind of joint pain. But don't forget what we call accumulated daily activity. And that is getting up and moving. 
that's your stairs, that's walking out to the store, that's just starting to incorporate more activity into your day. And that can actually start to boost your fitness levels and prepare you for something where you can get that intensity. I think that's really important message. And I know at Cleveland Clinic Canada, where I do these uh, executive health physicals and see some sports medicine as well, I encourage everyone to do exercise every day, like minimum 30 minutes. Uh, and what I've found is that there's, there's always something you can do, whether it's, you know, if it's not running for, because of a variety of reasons, there's always something. And part of the challenge as a physician or a clinician or a therapist is, is talking to the patient as both of you do and find out you know, what is it that they like to do and what, what other options can we give them, whether, especially at this time, you know, whether it's online or what have you. So, so both, uh, both of those, um, both of you gave great advice there as well. Um, now, it's important to train correctly um, because if you don't train correctly, uh, you're certainly at greater um, chance of, of having injury. And especially as we age, uh, it does take a little bit longer to recover from injury. So we don't want to get an injury. Um, and we want to, but we want to be healthy. We want to exercise. So uh, perhaps, um, Beth, you could speak about this. And, and we often talk about exercise in terms of, you know, how, so if I don't have a therapist, I don't have a personal trainer, I don't go to the Y, what things should I consider when I'm making up my own workout, for instance? And uh, we discussed this earlier, so uh, maybe you could speak to this starting out, Beth. Sure, so this is uh, something we look at whenever we're creating a program for any of our patients, especially something I took into consideration when I started to create the running program. Uh, frequency, intensity, time, and type are all things that you need to look at. So frequency would be how many times a week are you going to do it? Is it realistic to do something seven days a week? Absolutely not. You should not have to do something every single day. You need time for your body to be able to rest. How hard are you going to do it or what the intensity is? Are you going to do nothing but run up a big steep hill at a high intensity? It's probably not going to be very effective or healthy for you as well. So you need to look at how hard you're going to be doing something. The amount of time. Am I going to go out today and run for two hours? I haven't done that since I did my last half marathon. So the amount of time needs to be realistic. So you need to factor that in as well. And then it depends on the type of activity that you're going to be doing, whether it's going to be running, cycling, swimming, just getting up and going out for a really nice walk. Like I used to walk when I lived in Toronto from downtown to the beaches all the time. And that's a pretty significant walk. Is that something I would start with necessarily? You need to set some realistic goals for yourself and kind of make sure that you, you kind of edge your way into it. And there's a certain a, a progression. So like I mentioned with running, it would be 10% changes per week. So there's a certain kind of increase. And there's lots of other things that you need to consider. Would you increase your frequency or how often you're doing something and your intensity at the same time? Probably not. You would focus on one thing to change, not all things to change at the same time. And that will lead to you being a lot more successful as you, as you go. The risk of injury often increases when you have higher intensity workouts and like if you want to run faster, a lot of people when they start, they just want to go out of the gate and really kind of do things fast and hard. And so it, it's important to take a step back and, and realize it's okay to start out easy and it's okay to just take one foot and put it in front of the other and then evaluate how you're feeling. And then you can make changes to one of those things at a time as you need to. Can you add anything to that, uh, Julia? Uh, Beth, that was great. I think it's very comprehensive. I'll tell you what I do in the office is I take that frequency, intensity, time and type. And then I try and figure out what stage of change the patient is in or the person is in. 
stage of change is uh, a model that we use when we want to change a behavior, like start an exercise program. And the stages are pre-contemplation, not ready for it yet. Contemplation, thinking about it. Preparation, I'm going to do it, but I need some, some information. I need to buy some shoes. Action, here's my plan. And maintenance, I got this. So if I match the FIT formula with their stage of change, I'm going to find the right starting place. And that starting place allows you to then get your baseline for when you increase your 10% or which factor you increase. So something in pre-contemplation, we've just said, is probably not going to go to a running program. We're going to get them doing activities during their day. But someone who is in the preparation phase, I want to give them lots of information about um, how often should you run and what does recovery mean and how do you monitor intensity by your sweat or by your talk. So it helps me customize it to that person. Um, and certainly in sports medicine, particularly, uh, most of the injuries that I see are from, from overuse. And it's from, as Beth mentioned, increasing several of these things at the same time. Uh, you know, January is probably one of our busiest times. Why? Because New Year's resolutions. I'm darn it, I'm going to start exercising. And, and so people suddenly change. They're going every day. They increase uh, at a high level and they do a lot of mistakes. Uh, so it is important uh, to follow these uh, guidelines. Just going back, I did have a question uh, from one of our uh, participants who says, I am 70 years old. I walk at a good clip outdoors. Uh, 50 minutes, six days a week. Is this moderate? Question mark. So Kathy, maybe I'll, I'll take that. Um, it sounds like it's in the moderate activity level. I would say um, within your walking, I would want to see some variation, slow, medium, fast, medium, slow. And that gets your, your heart rate more challenged because you're very used to walking specific, specific time every day. So I'd still want to challenge. And I'd still want to have days where you might do a shorter, lighter walk and days where you might do a longer walk. But to me, you're, you're in that target zone of moderate. And what yeah, I would, oh, oh, sorry. No, I would just like to add that that's absolutely correct. Dr. Lean's like spot on with that. And it's just that idea of if you did the same thing every day for two weeks, at some point your body won't adapt the same way. So you do need to challenge it differently. So it's important to, to revisit it and make sure there's subtle changes like Dr. Lean spoke about. So a couple of things. One is, you know, maybe not doing the same thing every day. So for this 70-year-old uh, uh, person, who I'm pretty sure I know who it is, uh, what I would say is that you do want to vary your pace. And in, in track, being an old track coach, we used to talk about LSD, long, slow distance, uh, and also fartlek, which is not a bad word. It's a Scandinavian word that stands for varied pace. And um, so we're talking, when we talk about fartlek, it's kind of like interval training and the heart rate's going up and down a little bit and so forth. And one way of doing that is if you're walking, is you say, I'm gonna pick it up to the next lamppost and then I'm gonna slow it down and then I'm gonna pick it up to the next bench because if you're walking, let's say in the beaches, uh, you might wanna go from you know, every third bench you pick it up and then drop it down and so forth so that you're getting more training effect like both of you have said. Uh, the other thing is you know, if you read about training and you read about uh, you know, the um, Cellier's principles of stress and so forth. They talk about how important stress is. And exercise is a form of stress as well. And it's important to give your body time to recover from that stress. And I know we earlier we were talking a little bit about recovery before the webinar started and how to incorporate recovery into the program. Uh, and maybe we could talk a bit about, uh, about the importance of recovery and uh, how to uh, integrate that into the training. Any uh, suggestions there, perhaps, uh, Julia? 
Sure. Well, I think you want to think about micro and macro recovery. Micro recovery is within your uh, exercise session. You've got a warm up where you're getting your body moving. You've got a cool down and you've got some variation in intensity. That's a recovery strategy. Macro recovery is where you have days that you don't exercise. You may be doing other things, meditation. You might be doing some stretching and you have other days where you do. So there's recovery days. I will say that even with our Olympic athletes, everyone has a recovery day. So the idea of, of having the same activity or high intensity activity seven days a week just doesn't seem to work for our bodies. So we have light days, we have recovery days, we have higher intensity days. And this seems to help our muscles recover and repair from the stress and overload that's needed to actually strengthen muscles. So it's again, a bit of a dichotomy. In order to strengthen, I've got to overload, but in order to allow rebuilding, I've got to have recovery time. And particularly with aging often, if we just need a little more recovery time. We can do all that we did before, but, uh, uh, you know, it's important to pay attention to what our body tells us that we need as well. Uh, a cookie cutter formula isn't, uh, isn't good. It's important to pay attention to how we're, we're feeling. Yeah, and um, Kathy, you, you made me think of a good thing, not only with aging, but at the other end of the spectrum. We know that um, adolescents going through puberty who start to do strength training actually need two days between strength training sessions to recover. So anytime our body is changing, pregnancy is the same. We need a little more recovery with our overload. And Kathy, I would just also mention that you can't do the same activity all the time. It's also not very good for you to do that. Cross training is extremely important. It's great if you love to cycle. It's great if you love to run, but you're going to get you're going to get repetitive strain injuries if you're not looking to do other things as well. So it's important to look outside of your favorite activities in order to help with that recovery. And I have a question for you, Beth, from someone there saying, how long should you wait before you seek treatment? Um, this is a, a bit of a thing in the clinic because often we see patients and they say, I say, how long ago you know, did this start? And they'll say two months, three months, four months. So if you're starting a program or if you're active and you start to feel some discomfort, that's it's kind of a normal thing. When you're starting to do a little bit of a heavier weight training program, if you're starting to run a little bit further, there is some muscle soreness that will happen. But if it's been lingering for more than a week, especially if it's been lingering for more than two weeks, the likelihood is you need to talk to somebody about it because it's not just going to go away on its own. And a therapist, like a personal trainer, a physiotherapist, a chiropractor, an osteopath, these are all people that can kind of help identify what might be the problem. Is it something that you're doing in your technique? Is it form? Do you have an injury? If you don't nip it in the bud, what will happen is you're going to miss your whole season because it's going to fester, it's going to get worse, and then you're not going to be participating at all. So there's this real balance between is it a little bit sore or am I going to totally miss out on my activity? And one of the things that I really hate to tell runners is I'm sorry, you're going to need to take six to eight weeks off because this is not going to get any better. Had I seen you initially right at the onset, it would be a different story. Excellent. I had another question for Julia and it says um, that I have been one of those people that has been at home doing everything, working from home, taking care of kids and so forth. I'm more stressed than I've ever been in my life and seem to have issues coming up with anxiety. Uh, can fitness or exercise actually help this? Hmm. Great, great question. Um, so I'll talk about the science first. The science says yes. At one time, we thought it was the marathon runner, the long distance runner that had endorphins and benefited from exercise reducing stress. But actually, we know now that it is the mind's connection to a physical activity that helps the mind reframe, that helps the thought track become more focused, and that has a calming effect on us. And there's actually production of uh, serotonin 
uh, within the brain that occurs with exercise. So whether that is a mind body exercise like Tai Chi or yoga, whether that is going for a walk where you're really focused on the walk or maybe listening to music or a book, you're taking your mind somewhere else and there's a physical activity with it, or whether it's gardening and you again are doing the same thing, physical and taking your mind down a different track, that has proven to be positive both physiologically chemical changes in your brain, but also emotionally and spiritually that you just feel better afterwards. So I think it's, I think it's a great way to de-stress. Um, and finally, should we stretch before we exercise, Julia? You had talked before about stretching in your blog. Yeah, so I'll just say briefly that the science has changed on stretching, uh, a dynamic gradual warm up stretch. So if I'm going to go for a jog, I'll take some long stride walks, long steps. I might go for a light jog before I start to run heavier. That's a dynamic warm up. The long, deep stretches, isolated muscle stretches are when your body's warm. And that's after you run, after your exercise. Great advice. We have about two minutes left uh, for today's webinar. And I wondered if, uh, starting with Beth, maybe you could give any last minute uh, advice or tips or encouragement to, uh, to our audience uh, today before we, uh, before we say goodbye. Um, I would just say that everyone can incorporate activity and everyone should get up and get moving. Even if you have severe osteoarthritis, we do have a great program that's actually operating virtually, which, in, which is called the GLAD program and it does feature osteoarthritis. So really, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, email me. Like I'm happy to receive some emails and happy to talk about anything that you need. But really just try to make a point of getting active and getting up and getting for a walk or doing something every day. It'll help you more than just physically. Oh yeah. Um, set a goal. Uh, and the goal doesn't have to be an Olympic medal. The goal doesn't have to be a marathon. But set a goal. Today I'm going to get out there and just walk 10 minutes. Uh, but that goal setting and writing that goal down and making it a goal that you want and a goal that you know why you want it really becomes your internal motivation. Right now we're providing with some external motivation. You want to get it to the internal motivation so that you have a reason to move every day. And part of that will be you'll start to feel better. And that becomes a goal within it itself. You want to feel more energy. You want to feel less tightness. You want to feel more in tune with your body. And interestingly, our psychologists really support that routine of doing something every day as well, how important that is through mental health as well. So, uh, so thank you to uh, Dr. Julia Lane and Beth Douglas. Uh, today. Um, really appreciate you uh, participating. Thank you for all our participants. And um, I've included some information here if anyone wants further information. And if you want to jump on that, uh, that uh, running uh, workshop, I believe it's on at noon today with Megan Grantham. So thanks very much, everyone. And thanks, thanks for having us, Kathy. Thank you.